Concentration is something you put together. You've got the breath, and you've got your awareness, and you've got your thoughts, and you try to bring them together, keep them together. And you just got to have some strategies for keeping them together once they're there, because otherwise they come together and then they go their separate ways. This is why we work with the breath. Experiment to see what kind of breathing feels good right now. So you can take an interest in what's going on in the present moment. And given that you're already shaping the present moment, try to shape it in a good way. The breath is what the Buddha calls bodily fabrication. When you direct your thoughts to something and you evaluate it, that's called verbal fabrication. You're basically talking to yourself about it. So you can talk to yourself about the breath. The proviso being that you want to talk about it skillfully, ask questions that actually help you to settle down. What kind of breathing would be more comfortable? Satisfying right now. What does the body need right now in terms of breath energy? What kind of breathing would fulfill that need? Take an interest in this. After all, it's, it's through the breath that you experience the body and through the body that you experience the world out there. So pay attention to this medium through which you experience everything else. How's it going? Where do you feel it? Can you feel it throughout the body? If at the beginning you can't feel it everywhere, try to focus on the areas where you can feel it. And you'll find that they may or may not correspond to where you think you should be experiencing the breath. But this is a good lesson right there. What your immediate experience is may not be what you think it should be. And work with what you've got, what you actually have there. So you can begin to call some of your preconceived notions into question. Once there's a sense of ease in the breath, think of it spreading around. Because what we're trying to develop here is a state of mind where you're still and focused, but at the same time your awareness is all around. The focus is so that you can see things precisely. The all-aroundness is so that you can see things out of the corner of your eye that you might have missed otherwise. Because there's stuff going on all around you in the mind. Just like the breath is going on all around you in the body. And if you're focused on one problem, often the real cause of the problem is hidden away in the area that you don't have any awareness. So you want to create a state of mind that's st centered but all around. Still and all around. The question comes up sometimes, how much concentration is enough? And the answer is, you, if it's, it's enough, you can actually see what's going on in the mind and can begin to apply some appropriate attention. In other words, asking, where is the stress here right now? What's the cause? What can I do to put an end to the cause? And what happens when the cause ends? And you can ask those questions on many levels. It's not the case that you try a state of concentration, and if it doesn't get all the way to jhana, you throw it out. And then try another state of concentration, throw that out. You don't throw out your concentration. You build on what you've got. The quality of being single with your object, or having a single focus. The Buddha uses the same term in the concentration that he does when you're listening to a Dharma talk, or the way he recommends that you listen to a Dharma talk. The word is agaka. Sometimes translated as one pointed, but the word aga, ega means one. Aga doesn't necessarily mean point. It means summit, and but it also means gathering place. 
So wants your attention to be gathered around one thing. When you're listening to a Dharma talk, the kind of concentration where you can focus on the talk and apply appropriate attention. In other words, ask, what does this talk teach me about my own suffering and the way I can handle it, deal with it? That's appropriate attention. So you're focused, and you can hear, and you can think, when the mind is agaka. We take that concentration and just apply it inside. In the beginning, you'll be dealing with blatant examples of suffering or blatant causes. And so for the time being, that amount of concentration is good enough for you. If you can see through a particular cause of suffering and realize that you're losing your interest in it, you're losing your desire to follow it. That's enough concentration for that problem. And then gradually, as you clear away the big problems, the mind will settle down even more. Your sensitivity will get greater, and you start noticing the little problems. And you clear those away. And if you can't clear them away yet, just continue trying to stay with the breath, get everything centered. Be watchful, but you can't guarantee that the problem will come along when you want. It's like being a hunter. You go out and you have to be very still, but very alert. If you're not still, then the animal will run away. If you're not alert, the animal will come right by and you wouldn't notice. So we're here to catch the animals of our greed and aversion and delusion in their many forms. And so you deal with whatever comes up that's going to disturb your concentration. And if you can deal with it and undercut it, understand it, drop the cause, okay, that amount of concentration was enough for that particular problem. And so you take that concentration and then you stick with it. And it's in the sticking with it that it has a chance to grow. This is why when you read about jhana, you read about it and then you have to put it aside. When you're here to focus on the breath, you're not here to focus on jhana. You're here to focus on the breath and creating a mind state that allows you to see what's going on in the mind. And whether it reaches jhana at this particular time or not, that's not the issue. The issue is, can you get the mind still enough so you can start seeing what's going on and comprehending what's going on? and apply those questions of appropriate attention. Where is the stress? What's causing it? What can I do to put an end to it? What am I engaged in that I should learn how to stop engaging in? What am I feeding on that I should stop feeding on? In this way, as you pursue these questions and start sensing problems that you didn't see before, that's a sign that the concentration is progressing. Because you've got to clear away the, the gross trees before you can get to the bushes, and then you clear away the bushes before you can get to the more subtle plants inside. But this is all put together. This is fabricated. As the Buddha said, the goal is unfabricated, but the path there is fabricated. Always keep that point in mind. It's not that the path is going to cause the goal, but if you follow the path, it gets there. It's like the road to the Grand Canyon. There are actually two roads to the South Rim. If you've ever been there, you know if you go from the south, you travel through a country that doesn't look like the Grand Canyon at all. It's flat and scrubby, very uninteresting. You can be just a mile away from the Grand Canyon and not know it. Then you get the Grand Canyon as something totally different, totally other. And there is that aspect of the path, because it does require desire, and you are creating things, you're fabricating things. These are activities that we're engaged in right now. 
but there are activities of clearing things away. I was reading a Dharma book a little while back where the, the author was dividing paths or conceptions of paths into two sorts. One is the idea that the path creates a state of awakening, and you have to work hard, hard, hard to create that state of awakening. And the other is that awakening is already there, and all I have to do is relax into it. Now, if those are the only two options, the, the second one would make more sense, in the sense that you can't create something uncreated, unfabricated. But it turns out you can't just relax into nirvana, because the mind is constantly fabricating things all the time and doesn't let them go very easily. Our hand has the ability to let go, but also has the ability to grab things. And then it goes back and forth between the two, and in the same way the mind does that. It lets go and grabs, lets go, lets go and grabs. And you've got to look into that habit of grabbing and take it apart. That requires that you analyze things and understand things. Because there is a third option for understanding how the path relates to awakening, and that's in John Lee's image of salt water. You want fresh water, and there is fresh water in the salt water, but it's not going to come out of the salt water if you just let the salt water sit. You've got to boil it, distill it. Got the effort of the practice is the boiling. You've got to get the salt out, and there it is, the fresh water that was always there. But you couldn't attain it unless you put the water through a process. This is what we're doing, taking the mind and putting it through this process of getting rid of the, the salt. So even though we're aiming at a goal that is not an activity at all. It requires an activity to get there. As the Buddha said, this is the kind of action that puts an end to action. And so there'll be room for desire. You want to get to the goal. There'll be a room for a sense of frustration that you're not there yet. The Buddha said that's a useful emotion to develop. He says, most often say we're, we're feeling upset about things around us, things we see or hear or smell or taste or touch or think about. And we try to change them into things that we like to see or hear or smell or taste or touch or think about. He says that goes nowhere, because the way of the world is that it's going to keep going back and forth. There's gain and then there's loss, status, loss, status, praise and criticism, pleasure and pain. The best way to get out of that cycle, he says, is to go for what he calls renunciate pain, the thought that there is the goal and other people have attained it, but I haven't attained it yet. There's a little bit of conceit in there and there's a little bit of frustration, but he said that's the thought that motivates you, gets you going, gets you out of the other cycle, which is going back and forth between things you like and things you don't like. So there's a use for that kind of pain on the, on the path. It's to motivate you so you can get what he calls renunciate pleasure and renunciate equanimity, the pleasure that comes when you do attain the goal, and when you equanimity when you have that sense of peace that comes with the goal. Or in a John Swatt's image, we eat food because we want to be full. Now, fullness is one thing, the activity of eating is something else. It requires that we work. We have to get the food. We have to cook the food. We have to eat the food, spend all that chewing, all that time chewing, and then cleaning up afterwards, which is very different from the sense of fullness that comes as a result of the eating. The analogy, of course, breaks down because the, the eating does cause you to be full. But you think about that road, the south road into the south rim. To remind you that that's one aspect of the path. There's a lot about the path that's not like the goal at all, but it does the work. It gets you there. Once you're at the Grand Canyon, you don't have to think about the path anymore. But there's another road to the, the South Rim, which comes from the East, that represents a different set of problems. Because that road goes along the canyon in the Little Colorado. 
And if you've never seen the Grand Canyon before, you're riding along the road and you might start thinking, well, this must be part of the Grand Canyon. It's a fairly large canyon. It's only when you get to the Grand Canyon you realize, oh, that little Grand Canyon, little Colorado River Canyon really is little. It's nothing at all like the Grand Canyon. This represents the problem when you've attained a certain level of calm or stillness or gained some insight, and you think this must be it, and you stop right there. Again, a sense of peace inside, a sense of oneness inside, or you convince yourself that you see that there is no self. Then you figure out that must be awakening, because it sounds like what's in the books. But as soon as you put that stamp on that, you've gone wrong. So you have to be careful as you follow the path. Some things look pretty convincing, but they're not the goal. So you always have to ask yourself, is there anything more in here, any more stress inside the mind? This is why you want to get your concentration as good as possible and also learn how to apply these questions of appropriate attention to everything that comes up. An insight comes up, okay, does this totally put an end to stress? Or are you latching onto it simply because you feel proud that you've got an insight? What about the stress and the pride? Or a sense of oneness or concentration comes up. Can you see if there's still a problem in there? This is one of the characteristics that made the Buddha special, was he saw problems in attainments that other people thought were perfectly fine. They're the teachers who taught nothingness, or neither perception or non-perception, very refined levels of concentration. And as far as they were concerned, that's all you needed. The Buddha said, he noticed, okay, there's still something stressful in here, there's still something that's not totally deathless, it's not totally reliable in here. There must be something better. So it was his ability to see problems where no one else saw them that enabled him to become the Buddha. And this is something each of us has to do. We have to see problems where we never saw them before. This is why whatever comes up, you learn to apply a those questions of appropriate attention, and watch very carefully. Peel away anything that's obviously stress or causing stress, and then be patient to watch and see if there's anything else that comes up, any other little stress that disturbs the mind. This is why the Buddha has you ask those questions about inconstancy, because stress does come and go, because its cause comes and goes. The perception of inconstancy is not just to say, oh, things are inconstant, so I shouldn't let hold on to them, and then you somehow magically let go. You hold on to things because you think that's something worth holding on to, that, that the effort goes into it is repaid by the reward you get. There are a lot of things that we know are inconstant, but we still go for them. And the perception of inconstancy is there for things that you really think are worth it, worth the effort. You've got to look into it. Okay, Is it really worth the effort? Does it really reward you as much as you think it does? Is it really as peaceful or really as secure? And watch. And if you see any variation or any ups and downs in your state of mind, there's a sign, okay, that the work is not yet done. There's still a problem in there. It's like learning how to be the princess with a pea. You want to get so that you know that there's one pea under all those mattresses, because that's a sign there's still a problem. And then as you've developed your sensitivity, you finally get to the point where you realize, okay, when you do reach something that's totally different, totally other than the path. You'll know. It's because your sensitivity has been developed. 
through these questions, through these practices that you can see. That's when you get the fresh water. So we put in effort to get to a place that doesn't, that won't require effort when we get there. Ananda's analogy is of desire. You walk to a park because you have a desire to get there. Once you've arrived at the park, the desire is gone because it's been fulfilled. The different roads to the Grand Canyon, even though they're not the Grand Canyon, they'll get you there if you follow them. And the reward is more than worth the effort put in. <laughs>